my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Eisen. Thank you. All right, these are the pictures I took yesterday, but I'm going to get rid of them for now. Um, so um, I was telling people beforehand that I decided to completely restructure the way I give a talk uh, yesterday. So. Bear with me if this sucks. Um, all right, so um, what I want to do is just give you a little background on what we do in my lab before talking about um, a couple of key topics. So what I'm generally interested in is the origin of novelty, that, you know, sort of the origin of new functions or new processes. And if you look at this in terms of phylogeny, you have an organism in a tree, its descendants inherit the same trait, it's, you know, a red circle organism or something like that, and then there's some mutation, some origin of a new function to where it has, you know, the green appearance and the green phenotype. And for many years, when I was a graduate student and then when I worked at Tiger, um, what I was interested in is the origin of novelty that comes from intrinsic processes, that is mutation, recombination within a genome, and what um, affects that. So duplications, deletions, rearrangements, recombination. And in particular, what I was really interested in was comparing these processes between taxa and trying to understand why some taxa went down one path for their mutation and recombination pathways and other organisms went down a different path. That is, what is the evolvability of organisms related to their intrinsic processes? And since pretty much all I know how to do is grind stuff up and sequence it, I studied this via DNA sequencing. Um, originally, you know, Sanger, painful, slow sequencing, and then as sequencing got cheaper and cheaper, this got easier and easier. Um, and so for many years, this is what I focused on, but um, along the way, I switched my main focus into um, away from intrinsic changes to thinking about a separate way that organisms get novelty, which is what I call extrinsic changes. That is, they get something from the outside. Now, there are many people who have studied this for a very uh, long time. One example of an extrinsic process is sexual recombination. Um, lateral gene transfer, which I worked on for a while, but what I've become interested in mostly for the last 15 years or so is how um, organisms acquire novelty through symbioses, through interactions with other organisms. And um, for a while I worked on this, you could say, with single organisms, a symbiosis between two partners, and then started to branch out, you know, two symbionts, um, and then eventually I've done a lot of work recently on microbiomes, communities of microbes that interact with each other or interact with a host. And what I'm really interested in here is how does novelty come about through these types of interactions rather than through just mutations within your own genome? How do you acquire novelty through interacting with other organisms? And so this is sort of the central theme of what I work on and in um, different aspects of this what we I'm a comparative biologist, so I don't work on one system over a long period of time. I'm interested in the rules by which um, interactions lead to novelty. So we compare lots of different model systems. And I spend a, actually a huge fraction of my time thinking about um, uh, not just how we study this, but developing the tools that would allow us and other people to do these studies building up reference data and resources that would enable us and other people to do this work and communicating about it and trying to think about the participation in science and broadly and communicating the issues related to the model system that we're working on or something related to that. And as I never get to the end usually, so I have a, compiled all the people that have been in my lab over many years. This is all of them. Most of what I'm gonna be talking about I try to highlight the individual people when I talk about them. So what I changed with my talk is what I was originally planning to do was to focus on model systems um, at the beginning and then talk about some of these other things along the way. But I want to actually start out just giving you a few examples of how we use, I use this other aspect of my work that is, you could call this sort of the development of tools, development of resources and communicating about them. Um, rather than a particular scientific topic. So just as an example, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of these. So in terms of phylogenetic methods and tools, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how you build in an automated manner phylogenetic trees of individual genes or whole genomes. Um, this has become more and more important as genome data has gotten uh, easier to acquire. We need sort of automated processes for doing this, and I'm an obsessed phylogeneticist, so I don't like to do things that are not using an evolutionary tree, basically. 
Um, and so we've been trying to develop tools to do this from an evolutionary tree point of view. As you get, now there are something on the order of 500,000 bacterial genomes and another millions and millions of genomes that are coming from metagenomic data. We can't even do phylogeny of all this. So um, we don't develop phylogenetic tools for <laughs> analyzing all of the data anymore because it's just not feasible in many cases. We also, um, even though we're, we're still not developing the tools for doing this, we're interested in which genes you can use for doing phylogenetic analysis across a large number of data sets. So we've been scanning through genomes to ask which genes give reproducible signals that are similar to either the ribosome RNA tree or the whole genome tree for those particular taxa. And we do the same thing in terms of resources and reference data. So I'm just going to give you an example of this. When I was a tiger, we um, basically started to realize that most of the genome sequences were coming from just a small number of taxa. And um, Karen Nelson and Naomi Ward and I got a grant. We thought it was a really exciting grant at the time to sequence seven genomes <laughs> of bacteria um, from the phyla of bacteria for which there were cultured representatives but no genomes available at the time. And, you know, um, in retrospect, a single genome to represent, you know, one and a half billion years of evolution within a phylum is probably not the, you know, way to represent the biology of these organisms. But this was a really interesting project and really important. And then midway through the project, next generation sequencing was developed. And I also moved from uh, Maryland to UC Davis. And I got an adjunct appointment at the Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute, and we launched this uh, program called the GIBA, Genomic Encyclopedia of Bacteria and Archaea, that basically was to march our way through the tree of life, find branches for which there were cultured representatives, for which there were no genomes available, and get those genomes sequenced. We learned lots from doing this. We basically um, convinced ourselves, and we think a lot of other people, that phylogeny was a useful way to select genomes to obtain, and then that would help inform other people's studies of the diversity of life. I'm going to give you one example of this. So you may be familiar with people doing work on the gut microbiome of uh, hunter-gatherers and other people who live in sort of agrarian societies or not sort of the westernized, industrialized world. And when one of these studies was done, people found that there was a lineage of spirochetes that was found in many of the hunter-gatherer guts um, and, and not in westernized populations. And they tried to figure out what to how to make sense out of this, and they went to the reference genomes that came for the Human Microbiome Project. None of them were closely related to these spirochetes because all of those reference genomes came from cultures from people basically in Boston or, you know, New York or somewhere like that. Um, and they didn't have reference genomes from anything closely related to these particular spirochetes. But they found two reference genomes from the Genome Encyclopedia Project that were closely related to these spirochetes. So the goal of this Genome Encyclopedia Project was basically to fill in the structure of genomes across the tree of life that would enable anyone to make sense out of small amounts of environmental data or ribosomal RNA data or other things like that, and not just, you know, those that are working on model organisms or the human microbiome. This led to sort of cottage industry of genome encyclopedia projects. There was a GIBA cyanobacteria project. We ran a halophilic archaea GIBA-like project, and there were many, many more of these. A really important point that we realized pretty early on in this project was if you want to represent the phylogenetic diversity of bacteria and archaea, and actually eukaryotes too, going after the cultured organisms is not a really good way to get that full representation of diversity. Most of the phylogeny, so in um, blue is the things that were available for this genome encyclopedia, and red are the ones coming from this genome encyclopedia. In gray were the ones that were available possibly in culture collections, light, dark gray. In light gray were the evolutionary diversity of lineages that were available only from sequence data, not in culture collections. So we really, if we want to fill in the genomes across the tree of life, we need other approaches. And there have been many of these that people are probably familiar with. The JGI developed a single cell genome program. There have been multiple ones of these. And now we can get, you know, reasonable approximations of genomes from metagenomic data by assembly and binning that can fill in at least the scaffold of the tree of life to have reference data from across the full phylogeny of organisms rather than from just a limited subset. And I'm not going to tell you about all this, but all along the way, whenever I've been doing things, I've been really interested um, in the communication of science, in openness related to data, and openness related to publication, and openness related to software and code, and then also in just how we communicate about these particular areas and arenas.
And so I've been working on the microbiome uh, for many years, and as I'm sure many people are familiar, the microbiome has become absurdly hot over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, there's lots and lots of publications, lots and lots of news stories. There are many valid reasons for why it's become really hot. Uh, there's a growing appreciation of microbial diversity. There's something I call the post-genome blues, that is, we spent $3 billion to sequence the human genome, and some people said we were going to cure all diseases with that, and oh my god, we didn't. So um, it must be due to something else, and the microbiome has been one of those things that has come up as possibly being important. There have been incredible technological advances in all sorts of areas, especially DNA sequencing, but in lots of other areas, and um, the functions of the microbiome have become growing of interest um, in many different areas. So there's lots and lots of reasons why the human microbiome and model organism microbiomes and microbiomes from all sorts of different places have become of great interest and importance. And there are valid, uh, you know, really exciting things that have come from that. But there's a bad side to this, which is hype. So uh, along with an area becoming really hot comes, um, you know, crap, um, uh, unadulterated crap in many cases. And so I've been really, really worried about this. When I worked at Tiger and was involved in genome sequencing, I was worried about overselling genome projects. And we see the same thing with microbiomes. There's a lot of uh, overselling the microbiome and what, you know, people have been familiar with miscommunication about microbiology for a long time in an area that we sort of complain about a lot with germophobia where people are saying, you know, we need to put antibiotics in our toothpaste and in our clothes and in our shoes and in our air and you need to sterilize everything and we need to kill all microbes everywhere because they're gross. Um, and that's bad, but at the same time there's been what I call microbiomania, which is that all communities of microbes are there to help us and help all the animals and plants on the planet and they're perfect and ideal and optimized and they're all good. And if we just embrace all of those microbes, we're going to cure all diseases on the planet and make everything happy and healthy. And this dichotomy, all microbes bad versus all microbes good, kill all microbes, put probiotics in everything, avoid all microbes, you know, lick the subway poles, um, <laughs> fecal transplants will save the world, um, and all sorts of other things. I've been very, very worried about this um, because I think it's very damaging to the research on microbiomes to have people selling, saying that they can um, cure schizophrenia by doing a fecal transplant at home with a turkey baster. And I'm not kidding. That was the first overselling the microbiome award I gave on my blog was for a clinic that was advertising that. Um, so it's, it's scary and potentially dangerous. And, and so my original solution to this, and one I still do, is I complain. And I write snarky blog posts and I call myself during my talks. And I, no, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and, um, and you know, that works. Uh, complaining does, in fact, work. People respond sometimes to complaining. But there are other tools that are a little more positive. So I think education and outreach is also incredibly important. We've been involved in a lot of projects in my lab that relate sort of broadly to education outreach. A postdoc in my lab, well, now staff scientists developed a microbiome board game, for example, called Gut Check. It's released openly, so you can download the entire game and print it at home. Um, or you can uh, get a fancier version if it's still available. Um, and then citizen science. If we want people to think about microbes in a smart, intelligent way, why don't we engage them in scientific research about microbes? So we've been involved in many projects over the years in trying to figure out ways to do citizen science, citizen microbiology. It's challenging, of course, because so, as many people here know, I'm an obsessed birder. I went birding this morning and yesterday. Um, the birders are the amazing at citizen science. Um, in part, that's because you can get out your binoculars or even not your binoculars and you say, oh, that's an osprey. Um, and, you know, we're field guides that describe where you should find things and what they should look like and how to identify them and what, how, what they behave. It's a little more challenging with most microbes to do that. But there are still many very interesting citizen science projects and I encourage everybody to do more public outreach related to microbiology because I think it's incredibly important. Okay, so now, that's the part I wasn't going to talk about. Now I'm going to switch back to uh, the scientific uh, main theme here, which is um, related to the model systems that we work on. And what we've been doing a lot of recently, 
has been working on what I call the HMS Triangle. It's not, isn't HMS is like the abbreviation for His Majesty's ship or something? Like, no, sorry, I have to ask the Brits here for uh, what to do with that. Um, so what I mean about this is the host microbe stress triangle. And what we've been interested in is the biology of particular hosts, how microbes influence that biology, and how that interacts with various kinds of stress that are applied to that particular system. And in particular, in the last 10 or so years, we've been doing a lot of this with microbiomes as opposed to individual um, microbes. And what I'm really interested in is, relates to this evolvability issue, which is when you place a system, an organism and its microbes under a particular selective pressure, where novelty would be advantageous for it to develop, what pathway does it use to get to its novelty solution? For example, there's a lot of people that work on endosymbionts and symbioses involving bacteria and archaea who think, probably like I do, that you know, eukaryotes are metabolically incompetent most of the time, certainly multicellular ones, and if you put one of them under selection to develop a new metabolic process, it's way easier for it to acquire some type of interaction with a symbiont to carry out that metabolic process than it is for it to invent that process itself. It's not that invention of new metabolism never happens, but it's just if there's a nitrogen fixer out there or something that can degrade a particular carbon or fix carbon or do something, it's just on average more likely for that to evolve because it's easier for it to evolve. And then if we understand that, maybe we can manipulate systems um, to, to, to modify the interactions that are going on. So one area that I've worked on relates to this relates to nutrients. So you have a host and some microbes that are associated with that host, and the microbes are somehow involved in acquisition of nutrients for that organism. Um, many years ago, I had a collaboration with Nancy Moran that was working on the glassy wing sharpshooter, which is an obligate xylem feeding insect, so like aphids, which feed on phloem, that have endosymbionts inside their gut that make the amino acids that they don't get from phloem. Uh, the cicada family and their relatives are obligately feeding on xylem, which is basically like mineral water. And how the hell can they survive when they're obligately feeding on xylem? Turns out they have symbionts um, as well. And the symbionts that live inside the cicada family make even more things than the symbionts that live inside the phloem feeding insects. Um, we've worked on... Uh, Various plants that are growing in low nitrogen environments, trying to figure out if they're able to engage in symbioses to possibly acquire nitrogen from their environment, just like legumes do. We know lots about how legumes do this, and there is some suggestive evidence that a variety of other plants have less tightly associated symbioses than the legume rhizobia symbiosis, but some type of interaction with free-living microbes that might allow them to acquire nitrogen from the environment. Another area that we've spent a lot of time thinking about where, is where the stress is a pathogen. And there's lots of evidence from lots of diverse systems that the community of microbes that lives in and on an individual organism affects the probability of infection, affects the virulence of the pathogen, and can even attenuate the pathogen in a variety of ways. Um, many of the effects are pretty subtle, but there does appear to be um, many of these across the diversity of the tree. We've done work on um, uh, ducks and the infection with flu, and it appears that the microbiome may have some relationship to the probability of them getting infected with flu. I had a grad student working on koalas, and the koalas that get treatment for their chlamydia infections lose the microbes that live in their gut in part that may make them sick and no longer able to detoxify the eucalyptus that they feed on. I have two grad students working on this horrible chytrid problem across the diversity of amphibians where there's this fungal pathogen that's infecting amphibians across the globe, and there is some suggestive evidence that the skin microbiome on the amphibians can protect them from this chytrid or damage the chytrid or in some way uh, help them. But what I'm really interested in and what I want to talk about in more detail is um, the, the stress here being changing environments in some sense, either human impacts or other types of changing environments. And now we finally get to the marine system. So I, I consider myself originally a marine biologist, um, but then I lost my way until, until I heard this talk. So I was teaching this introductory biology course that you mentioned, Biodiversity in the Tree of Life. And one of my co-instructors in this course is a plant paleontologist, Jim Doyle. And he was talking about the evolution of aquatic monocots. And he mentioned as sort of a side story, 
Um, and I, here are my notes. I took notes while he was teaching that some even went into the ocean. Um, and then he started talking about the Elismatales and the grasses within the Elismatales that evolved from aquatic relatives, um, moved into the marine environment, and are now generally known as seagrasses. Now, I knew about seagrasses before this, but I didn't know the evolutionary side of the story of seagrasses. And for many years, I've been looking for interesting model systems to study the evolution of a host and how the microbiome responds to a particular interesting evolutionary scenario in that host biology. And so here's the Elismatales within the monocots. And if you look, according to the phylogenetic analysis done uh, many years ago by Les et al., there appear to be three separate invasions of the marine environment by aquatic Elismatales, or their ancestors, that then became seagrasses. That is, they're polyphyletic with these three separate invasions. There's a lot of diversity across seagrasses. But what's interesting is that at the phenotypic level, the morphological level, at the um, reproduction level, at a variety of other levels, there appears to be convergent evolution across these different lineages of seagrasses as they moved into the intertidal areas, into the marine environment, lots of selective pressure is going on. So I got really interested in what's going on with their microbiome. Did the microbiome come with them from the freshwater and then evolve in the saltwater to modify the microbiome? Or did, when they moved into the saltwater, did they recruit a new microbiome that was already pre-adapted to the marine environment? Now, I got really interested in this, but I didn't know shit about seagrasses, <laughs> as I, you might be able to tell even today. Um, so fortunately, I have a colleague in my department at UC Davis, Jay Stackowitz, who is a seagrass ecological and evolutionary biologist and expert. He studies seagrass out at Bodega Marine Lab and in lots of different environments. And he'd been working in particular on this one lineage, one species of seagrass, Oster marina, also known as eelgrass. Um, it's found throughout the Northern Hemisphere. It's ecologically very important. And so we, over a few years, developed plans for a project and eventually got funding from the Gordon and Benny Moore Foundation to do what we called the Seagrass Microbiome Project. It had three main aims. Um, I'll come back to some of them later. But the basic overarching theme was the stress here was returning to the sea and what's going on with the seagrass microbiome interaction in terms of moving back into the marine environment. The aim that we had the most success in tackling was aim two, which was basically look at the community composition of seagrass and their microbiome. So the first thing we did, we basically mimicked what was seen in lots of other terrestrial plants or the human microbiome and said, let's look at within individual biogeography of the microbiome. It's not that there weren't any studies of seagrass and their microbiome before we did this work. Most of the studies had um, been culture-based. Most of the studies that had not been culture-based had been with Sanger sequencing and had just very limited numbers to have an idea as to what the diversity that was going on. So we basically, or uh, people in my lab, cut up individual seagrass plants, did a biogeography of the taxa that you find in different parts of the seagrass. Not surprisingly, the diversity varies by location. Um, the rhizomes and the roots versus shoot roots versus leaf versus stem had very different community compositions. So it's not just that there's a seagrass sitting in the water and lots of things colonize it. There's clearly different parts of the individual plant and lots of diversity of who's there. We were very fortunate that Jay was a co-PI on a project known as the Zostera Experimental Network, which is a coordination network of people working on Zostera across the globe. There were 40 sites in 24 countries where people worked on this. And we decided to ask them in a Tom Sawyer-esque way if they could help us look at the microbiome in the Zoster Marina. Um, and when we asked them, they were like, well, if you, if you make it easy for us when we're doing something else, we'd be happy to help uh, collect your samples. So um, Jenna Lang and Russell Netchies in my lab built a kit to send to every one of these sites, which had gloves and scissors and a video on YouTube that they could link to. And, um, instructions for collecting leaf, shoot, root, water uh, samples. They made a coffee press to filter the water um, and other things and sent this to everybody. And amazingly, because this Zoster experimental network is so collaborative, we got back, I think, 95% of the kits that we sent out. I mean, it was really quite a remarkable thing. Um, and then we did sequencing of the ribosomal RNA amplicons from all of those samples, looked at the diversity across the globe, within these 24 different sites. 
um, looked at the taxonomic composition, showed, again, not that surprisingly, that there was some biogeographical structure in the microbiome. Um, the leaf roots and sediments, as we had found with individual plants, also saw that they were different from each other. The leaves greatly resembled the water in terms of total composition or much more similar to the water than to anything else. And they were more similar to the local water, whereas there was a lot of less biogeographical structure in some of the root associated data. We've also begun to tackle things beyond looking at the bacteria and the archaea associated with seagrass. I have a grad student, Cassie Ettinger, who spent the last three years working on trying to do culture independent surveys and culture surveys of the fungi. She just had a paper published a couple weeks ago on the culture independent surveys of the fungi. And the basic way this works is to do amplicon sequencing. It's much more challenging than bacteria and archaeal surveys because um, if you go after the ITS region, which many people go after for fungal environmental surveys, what you need to do is have a matching reference data set to look up the ITS sequence in that reference data set. If you work on fungi associated with humans, that works really well. Marine fungi does not work anywhere near as well, and seagrass associated fungi did not work um, particularly well. And so in many of these figures that in the paper and that you'll see here, there's a huge column with uncharacterized, unclassified fungi because many of these sequences could not um, be classified. So again, not surprisingly, the fungal taxa vary across different regions of the plant. The thing we were most interested in actually related to comparison to terrestrial systems where mycorrhizae have been found in most terrestrial plants to be very important for their function Microscopy-based surveys and culture-based surveys previously of seagrass had failed to see anything that resembled um, the traditional mycorrhizae. There are some other uh, possible cases where there's something related to mycorrhizae and seagrass. We didn't see anything in our surveys closely related to any known mycorrhizae. Um, again, not that surprising given what the functions are thought to be for mycorrhizae in terrestrial systems. But there are lots of fungi there, and what they're doing is largely unknown. Um, the unclassified fungi um, you know, represent a huge fraction of the data. And so what Cassie did was spend a little bit more time trying to tease apart some of these unclassified fungi. And the one thing that she's been spending a lot of time working on is to try and get data beyond the ITS from many of these organisms. So one way to do this is to walk your way outside the ITS with other PCR primers. And she did this for a couple of these lineages that seem to be abundant or interesting. And it turns out many of them are closely related to chytrids or actually are embedded within the chytrid phylum. So there is a lot of work now on marine chytrids. There's not a lot, as far as I know of, on chytrids associated with seagrass. But there is a lot of work of chytrids associated with marine single-celled algae and other um, algae. We think it might be that these chytrids that we're finding on the seagrass are actually associating with um, diatoms or other photosynthetic microbes that are sitting on the seagrass that are not actually infecting the seagrass. We don't have microscopy data yet to follow this up, but she's working on that. Um, so anyway, there's basically, we're just starting to get a handle on the global biodiversity of fungi associated with Zostromorina. We don't have um, a lot of information. We've been trying to have a better understanding of what the microbial community is doing from a functional point of view, and this has come both from some predictions based upon sequence data and a few experimental studies that, from, for our work, there are other studies where people have looked at this. So if you do predictions of what microbes are doing based upon, for example, the ribosomal RNA sequences that you find in particular environments, it's a very, very strong signal associated with the root microbiome of seagrass that there's a strong potential role for sulfur metabolism in the roots. There are many sulfur metabolizing microbes that have been cultured from the roots of seagrass. There are a lot of hypotheses about there, out there about the importance in anoxic sediments for detoxification and for other types of sulfur metabolism. And we see a very consistent signal across a lot of different environments for the predicted metabolism of many of the abundant taxa found associated with seagrass. We also done some experimental studies. So Cassie um, led a project to look at whether or not um, if you manipulate the community where seagrass are growing, is there a different microbial community on the inside versus the edge versus the outside of a system? And there does seem to be some effect. There's less of an effect on the microbiome in terms of an edge effect than on the physiology of the plants. We 
that might mean that the microbiome is not impacting the physiology that they're looking at for these edge effects. We don't know um, exactly what this means. And we've done, I'm just going to give you one example of this. We've done a lot of experiments in the lab where people bring in azostomerine into the lab and then do some manipulation of the nutrient conditions in the lab. And we've tracked the microbiome in association with these nutrient manipulations or temperature manipulations or treatment with antibiotics or a variety of other things. And I'm, just, I'm not going to go into all the details on this, but um, uh, there's a lot of suggestive evidence that the microbes that are associated with the roots in particular, but also with the leaves, are involved in a variety of sulfur and nitrogen metabolism um, functions. So um, our grant from the Moore Foundation to cover this um, uh, led to a lot of different really interesting things. And ever since then, this grant expired maybe two or three years ago, ever since then I've been thinking I, I need, I want to work on seagrass. I want to find ways to keep working on um, seagrass associated microbiomes. And one um, important thing that I've sort of hinted at but not really talked about is that the seagrass microbiome is way more difficult to work on than those of many model organisms. Um, and there are many reasons for this, but um, many of them relate to the lack of methods and tools, resources and reference data related to seagrass microbiomes. So we spent the last few years basically trolling the literature and thinking about what makes a model system for host microbiome studies and which are or are not available for Zostra. So I've actually done a lot of work in other model systems. My first work at UC Davis on microbiomes was on Drosophila. We've done a lot of work on rice and corn and Arabidopsis and mouse. And if you look at those systems and you look at what other people have learned, there's sort of a list of things that you really need to have available in order to turn an organism into a model system for host um, microbiome studies. We've created a page on our, we have a seagrassmicrobiomes.org blog about seagrass microbiomes, and we've created a page where we're trying to list the things that are or are not available for Zostra marina related to um, becoming a model for this type of symbiosis. So, for example, it was the first genome available for seagrass was uh, published uh, three years ago now, uh, Janine Olson and colleagues, sequencing done at the JGI. Um, it's the only uh, high quality genome that's still available for any seagrass. There are other ones that are in work in progress. There's also a lot of transcriptome data. There's no good genetics for Zostra marina right now. That would be very useful for turning it into a model system. But there are some other things coming. So for example, we got JGI to do a resequencing project where they resequence 200 and so individual Zostra marina plants and also from those same individual plants collected microbiome data. And now we're working on analyzing this data to do a microbiome GWAS basically for Zostra marina to see if there are any genes in the genome that affect the relative abundance of particular taxa in the microbiome. Um, and we use the same sort of kit-based approach to get data on that. There's work that people in Jay Stackowitz's lab have been doing to try and manipulate the microbiome of seagrass to see if we can knock it down, for example, with antibiotics or with bleaching or other things so that then when we reintroduce microbes, we can maybe learn a bit more about their phenotypes. Um, uh, Raquel Pixoto, who's been doing sabbatical in my lab, has a lot of expertise with this in coral and has been helping people in Jay's lab try and do this with seagrass. Um, we use what I call massively parallel undergraduates to do um, <laughs> some of this work. And, and largely, the limitation for us in a lot of this work is that there just is not a big culture collection. So we've been culturing a lot of things from seagrass in my lab. Um, we have a collection of a variety of things. If you look at what's available in public culture collections and what people share, and I have a link on that site about this, there are maybe about 15 microbes that have been isolated from seagrass that are available in publicly available culture collections. And not all of those are even from Zostra marina. Culture collections are struggling, as many people know right now. Um, the ones that provide cultures from the human microbiome may be doing reasonably well, but there's just not a lot out there. So we're hoping to find a way to build up a culture collection and a resource for seagrass microbiome studies. Um, we're still not sure how that would be funded or supported. Um, we've been generating reference genomes for these cultures. Sequencing a genome is cheap now, so we can generate a reference genome. We're also generating mags from a variety of environmental samples, and we've built 
something mimicking what was done with the human microbiome. There was this really nice effort in the human microbiome to basically say, let's look at environmental sequence data, let's look at cultures that we have, let's look at metagenomic data, let's look at microscopy, and try and come up with a list of which taxa are there in the system that we don't have cultures of or don't have diverse cultures of. And this was called, a, I think, the hit list for human microbiome culture collection. And right now, many of those, I think even most genera for which people wanted cultures for, for the human microbiome, a lot of those have been filled in by targeted efforts to go after particular clades. We've been starting to do that with seagrass. It's a bigger effort right now because we're, you know, only a couple of labs working on this. But we think that it is doable and that we can eventually have a big culture collection from Zoster marina. So the last thing I want to talk about is one single lesson, really, but it's two parts to the lesson, um, which is uh, what goes around comes around um, and that seagrass is part of a larger system. That is, so um, I'm very interested in seagrass microbiomes, but I realize that seagrass don't live in isolation. Um, and um, amazingly, serendipitously, we bumped into something that I should have actually thought about more based upon my past record and it relates to this same study of the biogeography within individual plants. When we first did this, we did ribosomal RNA and ITS-PCR and sequencing to characterize the diversity within individual plants. And a few years later, Laura Van, who was a grad student in my lab, went back to the freezer and we had DNA from these same original samples and submitted a few of them for shotgun metagenomic sequencing just to see if we got anything different, if the ribosome RNA PCR and the ITS PCR was biased in some way, or if we saw something different with the metagenomics. And we, we saw lots of things, but I'm going to focus in on one thing that we saw, which was pretty amazing. So here's a phylogenetic tree of some sequences, uh, a 16S single individual sequence and then other ones closely related to it from Zostromarina metagenomic data. So this is not a PCR generated 16S, it's a 16S we found in the metagenomic data. And it's embedded within a clade where every other member of the clade is a chemosynthetic symbiont. It's a 16S from a chemosynthetic symbiont from a clam. So these are leucinid clams that it's most closely related to. So the reason that I uh, wish I had thought of this in advance was that's what I worked on as an undergraduate. Um, so when I was an undergraduate, I first fell in love with marine environments and then forgot about them um, because I worked with Colin Cavanaugh who was studying the chemosynthetic symbioses between various invertebrates. She originally was working on this in tube worms in the bottom of the ocean and then she um, found chemosynthetic endosymbionts living inside solomyid clam, clams um, that live in Woods Hole, Massachusetts in Zostera marina beds. So I used to go out and collect uh, clams from eelgrass beds in Woods Hole. Um, and then we did, I got a single paper out of a single 16S ribosomal RNA sequence from one single solomyid clam sample. That's the tree of that 16S here. And it's closely related to other chemosynthetic endosymbionts. And you know, this was in the old era of phylotyping, where we were trying to predict the biology of organisms based upon their 16S sequence if we couldn't culture them in the lab. And so we found some free-living relatives to this clade of chemosynthetic endosymbionts, like Thiomicrospira, that then people went and worked with and did experiments with in the lab, because you could culture it. Many years later, when I was a tiger and then at JGI, we sequenced the genomes with Colleen of some chemosynthetic endosymbionts, including the one of the giant clam, Calyptogena magnifica, and also the genome of the Solomyovilum symbiont. And again, I somehow had basically forgotten about this until a series of papers came out, say, reminding people of how many of the clams that have chemosynthetic endosymbionts live in tight association with seagrasses. There's a bunch of models that people have proposed that there might be yet another symbiosis involving those clams. It's unclear uh, whether or not that's true, but it was certainly interesting. And so there's lots of these leucinid clams and solomyid clams and seagrass beds. And Colleen, my undergraduate advisor, had been spending years trying to find environmental relatives of the chemosynthetic endosymbionts, especially of solomyovilum, because the data suggested that they were acquired by environmental infection rather than vertically transmitted. And she had been doing and 
postdocs and grad students and others had been doing 16S PCR from every type of sample that they could find associated with the seagrass beds. And no one, as far as I know, had ever found relatives, uh, very close relatives of the chemosynthetic symbionts outside of the clams uh, until metagenomic data came along. Actually, another group found a very similar thing and published a paper before us, but that's fine. Um, uh, just like six months ago or so. Um, so I don't know what the model is there, but I think it's very possible that the free-living versions of these chemosynthetic endosymbionts, um, like the environment that they found uh, find around seagrass, um, either because it's protective or because of the release of food from the seagrass or something to that effect. Um, and so we've found them in many of our metagenomic samples, the relatives of some organisms which otherwise are only known as intracellular symbionts of chemosynthetic uh, of clams. And that comes to the last little bit here, which is um, to think about whole systems. So we've been uh, involved in a really interesting collaboration with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute that was funded a couple of years ago by the Moore Foundation, which was largely about a different approach to a model system in marine microbiome studies, which was to say, let's not pick seagrass. I mean, I, I want to pick seagrass, but um, uh, let's not pick one particular plant or one particular animal or one particular like biology. Let's pick a site. Let's see, are there any places that might be useful to consider as a model system for studying microbiomes? And um, there is one such site that we managed to convince the Moore Foundation was interesting to work on, and that's the Panamanian Isthmus. So this is what we now call our Ismo Biome project. And the reason that this is interesting is that with the rise of the Panamanian Isthmus, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of species that previously had been able to mix their genes to exist as either separate populations within one species or even globally mixed species were now separated from each other and became their own species. And there's an enormous amount of data about the speciation events that have occurred in association with the rise of the Panamanian Isthmus. The gem there are thousands of geminate pairs where there's two species that are on the two sides of the Panamanian Isthmus that trace their ancestry to very close in time or right at the time with the rise of the Panamanian Isthmus. So what we've been interested in this project was trying to do studies of the evolution of the microbiomes of many, many different taxa at the same time, and how they were all affected in similar or different ways by the rise of the Panamanian Isthmus. And again, this was a collaboration with Stry. Bill Sizlow is the PI of this project. And um, we spent a couple of years doing surveys to try and figure out which were the best organisms to work on. And we have multiple people on the project doing things on urchins and on shrimp and on um, crabs and on a few other things. And I have a postdoc in my lab who's been working on this project. And without my pushing, she decided that the most interesting thing in this, uh, the two sides of the Panamanian Isthmus were the leucinid clams and their symbionts. So with a team of people from Stry and from Gillian Peterson's lab in Vienna and from Nicole Dubillier's lab and a variety of other places, she started to gather samples both from museums and from field sites of leucinid clams and their symbionts from the two sides of the Panamanian Isthmus. And many of these are geminate pairs that are thought to have speciated in association with the rise of the Isthmus. And she has started to generate um, whole genome sequences of the symbionts by grinding up the gill tissue and then doing shotgun sequencing at the same time that she gets the whole genome of the symbiont. You get the whole mitochondrial genome of the host, and so you can do co-phylogeny of the host and the symbiont and compare them to each other. And I don't have, she just sent me slides at like 11.30 last night, so um, I don't have a lot of uh, uh, direct results on this, but what she's basically been doing is looking for examples where there's you know, a suggestion of uh, horizontal transmission of symbionts, which seems to be going on. And there's other data from other leucinid, leucinids where that seems to be what's going on. And what she's going to do now is look at what evolutionary events have happened in the genomes of these symbionts on the two sides of the Panamanian Isthmus, especially when there have been horizontal versus vertical transmission. And so I think I should stop. Um, 
And again, thank all the people uh, in my lab. I tried to highlight their pictures on all these slides. I will post all these slides, by the way, to SlideShare in a couple hours um, if you're interested in this. And if um, I also have a, a set of papers. If you're ever interested in developing a new model system for host microbiome studies in particular, I trolled through about 50 papers where people talk about what things you need to do this to turn into a system into a model, and I'd be happy to share those with everyone. It's, some of the things are sort of obvious, some of them are not, um, not so obvious. So anyway, I will stop there. <laughs>